it's Julian, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how to make a full Terminal M style Cosmic Techno track. The style, it's a bit trancey, it's a bit progressive as well, but it's also a super hard hitting techno track that can work really well in a warehouse or in a rave. As usual, you can get the full project files, samples, MIDI, presets, everything like that from this video. It's available at the top of the description on my Bandcamp. You can also hear the full track arrangement there, because like I said in the intro, didn't want to put the full six minutes at the start of this video, that would be kind of tedious. So go listen to that there. It's also available on my Patreon if you're a patron. And yeah, let's get started. Alright, so here's the project. We're at 129 BPM, and the first sound here is the kick. So this kick is a pretty standard sort of rumble kick, so we have our main kick. Just like this really punchy one that I've made. With a bit of layering. And then you can also see we've got this EQ here, which is just boosting up the mids and the highs a little bit to give it a little bit more punch. And then underneath that we have this one. Which is the rumble, so it's that same kick. It's literally, you can see, it's even playing the same MIDI. But then this one we have an arpeggiator on it, so if I turn off these effects. So it's doing 16th notes, and then we're putting it through reverb. And this amp. And the low pass filter. And so it's a really good way to create that more like rolling, kind of steady rumble for the kick. And then we also have this being side chained to the main kick. And then I just have this EQ cutting at 28 hertz to cut out a bit of those low frequencies that you're not really going to hear, but they can mess up your mix if you don't do it. Then we have this rolling bass. So this is one of my loops actually, this is from uh, Definitive Techno Drum Loops Volume 4. And yeah, it's just this like rolling little bass loop, like if you play it... You can hear it's really subtle, but if I play it with the kick, you can hear how it kind of bounces off. You know, it's like all those 16th notes in there that are very bouncy. And that's just going to add a lot of nice movement to the overall kick. Here's without it. And with it, so yeah, you don't always need this with a soundtrack, but it's just gonna add something really nice to the groove of your track. And you notice we don't use this during the break, that's something to keep in mind. Like, I have the kick in the break here. You don't want to have this thing bouncing around there. You just save that for, like, the main drops, so to speak. And then the last layer for the kick here is this one. Which as you can hear is really quiet, so this is the same thing as the rumble, but we're kind of just isolating like the mids and the highs. So you can see, yeah, it's that arpeggiator kick, bit of reverb, an amp, a low pass filter, but you can see this one is a bit higher. So we're letting through some of those mid-range frequencies, and then we're also cutting out all the low frequencies there with that. So it's literally just to add a little bit of stereo movement, like... <laughs> like if I play it, essentially here's the whole kick without this. with it. Like you really hear it once I add it with the actual rumble there. And then on the group of those, you can see, so all we have is just filters, essentially. We're not using any group processing. You just want like four good layers here, which it could be three, it could be two, you know, it could be just the kick and the rumble, it could be just the kick and the rolling bass and the rumble. It could be a few different combinations, but whatever your layers are, you want them to really kind of just stand on their own, and then when you play them together, it just sounds good because they're coming together, rather than having it go through like a bunch of saturation and compression and stuff like that. It can really kind of mess this up. So, here I just have a high pass filter and then a low pass filter, and they both have tons of automation. You can see like yeah, the high pass is like that. It comes on in a lot of different parts, especially in the second part of the track. And then we have this EQ here, which is just cutting out those frequencies. I did this with the rumble, but I like to do it again on the group here as well. Again, it's just cutting out those frequencies that, like, you're not really going to hear, but they are adding some just really messy sub low end to your track. They can You can feel it a lot when you're in the club or when you're in a rave hearing your track. So that is the kick. And then we have the lead.
So you can hear the lean is being made using this sound. What's happening here is we have these chords actually playing, you can see. But then I have an arpeggiator on there, so it's creating that kind of like rhythm that you hear. Like if I turn that off. So it's kind of an interesting way of making this lead. You know, it's not the same as just putting in like the actual notes like brown, brown, brown. It's kind of more of like a sequence sort of sound. And it actually has like a lot of depth to it, I think, because it's going up here with this one step. So it's like you're kind of getting like different amounts of notes like here. There's three notes, and then it goes to two notes, so like, you kind of just get that little bit of nuance there. And you can really play around with that. And as far as the notes here, so it's actually very basic stuff in the G-sharp minor scale, especially for a techno track like this. You know, we're just using G-sharp, that's the key we're in, is G-sharp minor. We're using G-sharp, ninth, minor third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Like, that's really all it's going to be, like... You know, it's not really that complicated. It's just the scale. If you want to just kind of copy this one, like, totally can. Again, these are the notes that are being used to make a lot of these style of tracks. And you can also add in voices, like up here, the minor 7th. Technically, the ninth would actually be up there, because it's the ninth note in the scale. But you can see, you can also put it down there, so you get that, like, movement between those. But it's just kind of getting creative with, like, the endings. You know, like, for example, here. It ends like that, and then here it goes. You know, when it ends on that C sharp there, that's the fourth, so it's going to feel a little bit more tense, and it's going to make you want to resolve back to... Now, for the sound here, it's made with wavetables, so we have two saw waves here, and then you can see on the first one, we have a little bit of pulse width as well as sync on it. There's no modulation, but you can see, I'm just using a bit of unison as well to give it that big chorusy sound. Then we have a bit of amp, you can see, here's without it. And then with it. So you can hear why we do this, it adds a nice crunchiness to the sound and kind of like just some more texture. You know, a lot of times when you're just working with a basic like super solid lead like this, you know, how can you, like, what are some ways to make it exciting essentially? Like, what are some things we can do to make it so that it's not just going to be that same super saw that we've already heard so many times? And this is a great way to kind of give it your own texture. The key here is the dry wet. I don't have that much. Like, if I start to turn this up. Then obviously it becomes too messy, but just blending that a little bit with the dry signal. You can even do more if you want, but I like it down here. Just blending that in there is essentially all you're going to need. And now it's almost like you have two layers instead of just having one that's way over distorted by having the dry wet there. Then we have a bit of echo and some reverb. You can see there's automation on both of those, so the echo automation is really just for here because... When that disappears, you want it to kind of get a little bit louder. So you have those delays going. And then the reverb automation is actually right here, right before the drop. So that's how we make this disappear. And then it comes right back there. Then we have my width rack, which is essentially some multi-band stereo widening. You can see we have the Haas effect on the highs, and then just some widening on the mid. So I'm using that to make this a bit bigger. We have a drum bus, which is not doing anything. You can delete that. And then there's this low pass, which this just kind of brings it in, you know, in here. And then in coming into the drop, and then at the end of the drop, just making it disappear. And then finally we just have an auto pan, which is making it bounce off of the kick. And then we have the art. So this is the actual art mini. It's just a half note. That's the pattern. And that just keeps going on and on. And that's kind of what you want here. You know, you don't want to just do like a one bar pattern. But, or like a quarter note pattern or something like that. But usually like a half note like this. Or like one bar. Or, you know, just something that's going to be very repetitive. Like not constantly changing up the notes. But just creating a groove that can just keep going and going with the ARP. Essentially, like, that's the idea behind this one. So, these are all mostly just notes from the G-sharp minor scale, and it's mostly G-sharp as well, because if you look at this, you can see we have G-sharp, then another G-sharp, an octave down, D-sharp, which is just the fifth, another G-sharp, 
another G sharp, another G sharp, B, which is the minor third, and then G sharp. And really, it's like just knowing how to like kind of use that minor third to your advantage. Like, you know, we just up until that point, you're only hearing the root note and the fifth, so you're not really getting like that particular kind of like emotion to it. It's just a very like, you know, it is an arp that fits musically essentially. But then all of a sudden you add this in. And that's kind of where the emotion comes in. Again, it's very simple because this is a very short pattern. But I really think that's how you want to think about it, you know? Like, start with the root note and the fifth and maybe the fourth. And then use, like, minor thirds and sixth and ninth and stuff like that. Kind of sparingly to make it a little bit more... Kind of special when that note hits. Now, for the sound on this one, it's made with wavetable, so this is just a pretty straightforward, you can see it's a saw wave, and then a square wave with some pulse width and some sync on it. I have a low pass filter on there, which has automation, as you can imagine, you know, to just bring it in and out throughout the track. We also have a bit of this amp on loop on that. I have a bit of unison, some echo, some reverb, a little bit of auto pan to make it bounce off of the kick, a saturator, which fattens it up. You don't want to do too much, just a little bit like this works really well, though. Another low pass filter, which is kind of similar to the one that's on the synth, but it just really makes it so that it's going to fade in smoothly. We have some reverb here, which actually just automates in these parts. Just kind of makes it disappear there. And we also have this high pass filter, which just comes in for when the kick is playing, because this arm actually kind of has some low end stuff that can be a bit weird. Like, it works fine in the break here when this is off, but once you get to this main drop here, you need this to make it work with the kick, because a lot of times these synths, you wouldn't think of it, but they can actually have a lot of those, like, frequencies that would get in the way of the kick. And then we have this break bass, which is pretty simple. So it's just playing G-sharp again, that's the root note of the track. And there's just this big fat re space where we have a saw wave, a low pass filter which is being automated to bring it in like that. You can see the unison which is what creates the big like re space sound. And then just some drum must have found it up and then a high pass filter. Which is actually a really good technique because I've noticed like when I play my tracks out in a club or in a rave or something, if you have a, like say you have your rumble kick going all the way through the track and then you have a moment where everything stops and then all of a sudden the break comes and there's this big like re-space like exactly like this. If you just have that drop right away, if you just go right in with the like even if you have this little break here in the arrangement, if you just come in right here with the full bass like that, it's gonna be really jarring because what's happening is you're giving people a moment to chill and then like when you come back to having like kind of the full frequency spectrum filled up again you can't just go from zero to a hundred you have to go like if we're in zero right here this needs to be like 20 and then this is 50 and then this is gonna be 70 and then this is where you get to a hundred you know what I mean like instead of just dropping right in with that full bass right there we can have this just kind of fade in It's going to be a bit smoother. And then you're also getting that automation on the filter, on the actual synth. And it's like, it seems like a subtle thing to just put this long bass note in the background. But you can see, like, a lot of thought actually does go into it. So then we have this vocal pad. You can see this is being made with granulator. So yeah, it's a granular synth going on here. Essentially what a granular synth is, is it actually works very similar to a sampler, where there's not really, like, synthesis, where it's, like, saw waves or anything like that. You're just working with samples. But the difference between a granular synth and a sampler is the sampler just plays the sample from start to finish. This, as you can see with this little yellow line here, it's playing all different spots on the sample, essentially, and it's sort of, like, dancing around those. And so you get this really nice, kind of, like, evolving texture out of this. Where it's never going to be exactly the same thing twice, especially when you have a sample like this where you can see it's this vocal atmosphere, which has a lot of different little parts in it, so... It's just like a more interesting way of creating a pad than just like, you know, getting like a really basic like square wave or sine wave or something like that. And then we just have a bit of reverb on that, this low pass filter which brings it in and out, and then this auto pan as well which is just kind of making it bounce up from the kick. Which obviously, like, not much of that in the break. But then... But 
Can we take it away? You can see, like, it kind of sticks out. So you want something to kind of make it fit into the track a little bit more. And then we have these little background sounds. So as you can see, these are a bunch of mostly bass sounds, as well as like this little vocal atmosphere. And this clap. And these are just in there, you can see there's a little bit of a structure with these two, like the beginning of the track has a very particular way they're set up, the middle of the track has a very particular way, and then the ending here, the third part of the track, has a completely different way. And that's something you want to keep in mind. So what these are doing, is they're kind of filling out the background of the track, and I'll break down how to make them in a moment, but yeah, like, it's really more important, honestly, that you know, like, how important it is to have these, and also just, like, how many to have, you know, because a lot of times when I hear tracks, they do just this. There's no background sounds, and then you have, like, a drop. And it's all this stuff, but you can see, like, as cool as this stuff is, like, we need something in there that's gonna kind of keep the energy going. It feels like it's missing some energy. As you can hear, that's what these do really, really well. And so usually for these, you know, it's just going to be like these little bass sounds. Like here we have... This is bass I made where it's like... Two saw waves here with a bunch of unison and some glide. And then... This noise manipulator wavetable with a LFO on it. And that doesn't have any unison, but that's got the same glide. And then those are just going through like some multiband distortion where you can see I'm splitting it into the three different chains, the lows, mids, and highs, and distorting them differently. There's a bit of reverb, some drum bus, a high pass filter, an auto pan. This one's a pretty similar patch where you can see like... Yeah, it's this amber wavetable and then a saw wave. We've got some unison. There's a low pass filter which has that LFO moving it around, as well as... A bit of reverb and some drum bus, high pass filter, another auto pan. You can see, like, you know, it's really just a matter of getting in there and kind of just making the sounds. Like, it's not really that hard to make these sounds, but I think what's hard about it is just knowing to do it and also knowing how many to do and how to, like, make it fit into the track and all of that. Then we have, like, these bass donks as well, which these are... You know, more of the, like, plucky basses. These are both made with FM synthesis, so it's just three sine waves. On both of these, I'm pretty sure. Actually, the second one is just two sine waves. But yeah, so three sine waves, you can see on this first one. Again, the chorus pitch is there. And then the secret to these is the shaper. If I turn that off... See, it's really weak. And then if we turn that on... It just gives it that perfect amount of fullness. So that hard shaper is really good for these. I also have a bit of a filter envelope going on. And then just some short reverb. As well as the longer reverb that you hear ringing out. And then a high pass filter. And then for this one. Yeah, it's just going to be actually a saw wave with a sine wave FMing. We have a band pass filter with a sine shaper. And then just some amp distortion. Some echo and reverb. A little bit more saturation. And then this EQ. So yeah, that's all the bass sounds. Again, really not as complicated as you would think. You just kind of have to get in and start getting creative with those, but it's important to have these. If you don't have them, something is really going to be missing. You can also see on here, there's a low-pass filter, which is actually not being used. And then I just have this high-pass filter, which is actually turning off, like, here. So I don't think we really needed it once this bass was gone. Then we have our hi-hats and the percussion. So it starts with the main hi-hat. As you can hear, it's actually four layers. So we have this one. This one. Where's that echo? I wasn't actually doing anything. This one, which is adding even more punch. And then finally, this one for some hi-hat. As you can hear, it's all four sounds that are going to complement each other really well and are going to fit together really well so that you're not going to... It's not like you have to sit there and, like, do too much processing to make these work. It's just four sounds that kind of fill in the spaces for each other, if that makes any sense. And if you take out one of them... 
It's going to be a bit weak. So you need all of these. And that's really the secret to these hi-hats. Because, like, yeah, when you hear these in a track, you know, it seems pretty straightforward to just make a little, like, but it's a little bit more to it, and you really want to try to make it like as big and fat as you can. And that's really how you do that, is with this layering of not just multiple sounds together, and not just putting multiple sounds into saturation and compression or anything like that, but getting multiple sounds that are all doing different things that can fit together to create the one perfect hi-hat. And then we have the shaker. And this close hi-hat, you can hear it kind of playing off each other. We have this ride as well which has some echo on it. And I'm doing this thing with the utility to make it kind of bounce off of the kick where we're just doing like... It gives you a nice like sidechain ride sort of feel, but it's very controlled if you do it this way with the utility because you can really shape like... Like if I just sidechain that to the kick, it's not going to be nearly as smooth as that. So yeah, and then with that, that concludes all of the sort of like main sounds for the track. So essentially what you're going to do is you're going to set up those things, everything I just showed you, like start with the kick, then go up to the hi-hats and the percussion and stuff, then go and make like a lead, or maybe you start with your lead, but then you go and work backwards and do all that stuff and then bring the lead in. However it may be, you're going to want to set up everything up to this ride first, like all of these things, and then everything down here is really just like the background effects that are kind of carrying the track along. You know, these main things up here are the track, but without these things down here, you wouldn't really have much of a track, you would just have a loop. So it's kind of like two different sort of like groups of sound, and that's how I think about it. And you can see these things are a lot more sparse, for example like this clap. There's little stuff like that. We have like an effects loop for the beginning. Which is just one of mine. Pretty sure that's from Definitive Techno Drum Loops Volume 4. You know, there's little stuff like there's this tambourine for the break. Now, some of where it starts to get interesting are in some of these little groups down here. Like, there's another little like group of sounds like these three. So it's these three tracks of sounds, but you can hear just having those little, just like, just little tiny things like that. It's all going to come together. And then when you add that with these background sounds I already showed you. You can hear like a lot of grooves starts to come from this. So that's the idea also with like a lot of these little background effects. You know, you sort of create little grooves of maybe like three or four or five of them. And then you're kind of stacking those up throughout the track like this. There's also like, you know, builds there. And then this technique here where you put it through the auto pan so it's kind of like bouncing up. And you can see we also have a clap underneath that. And there's a crash too, which is like... Other than that, you know, it's all just a bunch of little different sounds here and there. There's like this white noise sweep, which is throughout the track. You can see I'm just using that in all these different parts to make like a nice little white noise sweep there. And then all these down here are just effects from my definitive track effects sample pack. Again, just like the little stuff that's going to come in throughout the track. It's not really that hard to make, of course, you know, anybody could grab effects samples, but you can see it's really in, like, how you put them in the track. And not just having it be the same thing every 8 bars or every 16 bars or whatever, but really creating, like, different grooves. Like, here, all three of these are playing at once. Then here, you just get one, and then you get two. And then finally, once the lead is starting to disappear, then we get all of them again. So, like... Just kind of keeping that in mind and how you can take things in and out throughout the arrangement of the track to make the track more exciting rather than just going and adding something every time you want to do that. I think that that's going to go a lot further and that's ultimately how it's going to work. Oh yeah, so. That is going to be it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed. As always, make sure to like this video as well as subscribe. And let me know what you think of this video in the comments. Like I said in the beginning, you can get the full project files, samples, MIDI, presets, everything like that from this video. is available right at the top of the description. 
on my band camp. This really helps to support me. Plus, you get this great track. You know, you can literally just take this and release it. You can take this and use it as a template to make your own tracks. You can take, like, just the lead. There's a lot to work with from here. And I'm trying to create just really great resources that can help everybody and not just be, like, you know, a sample pack. But actually something that you guys can take. And this is just $10. And you can really learn a lot about making an actual professional track that will actually get signed to these labels rather than just getting some loops to play around with. So yeah, definitely go check that out. Really helps support me. Plus, you get a great production resource. Thank you so much, everybody, for all the support. And I will see you tomorrow with another video.